everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We're going to be talking all about seasonal allergies in today's show. So if you struggle, you know, we've got spring rolling in, the pollen's everywhere, the mold counts are going up. Uh, if you really, really struggle, you're really going to want to pay close attention to, to this episode because we're going to be talking about uh, not only what you can do naturally, uh, but how you can adjust and manipulate your diet. Because a lot of people don't understand that, that food allergies actually play a major role in environmental allergies. And, and um, the more of the food issues you have, the more of the environmental issues you're going to have. And there's a way to redu reduce that. There's a way in some cases even to reverse it. And so if you're looking at uh, years of struggle along the, the lines of seasonal allergies and you're just looking for some type of meaningful relief beyond the medications, medications even are a crapshoot. A lot of times they, they work sometimes kind of sort of and other times they don't work at all and they don't come without their costs and consequences. So if you're looking for something natural, stay with me tonight. We're going to get through. We're going to talk at the very end all about the nutrient, nutritional uh, uh, components that can help with this and that can help support your body through these really, really challenging and rough times. So if you're new to the show, uh, the rules simply are this. If you've got an allergy related question, go ahead and type those in. Now I'm going to do my best to get those answered before we wrap it up today. So let's talk about how to overcome allergies naturally. So before we jump in directly to that, um, let's talk about the symptoms. I mean, I get this a lot. People come to see me. Uh, it's very common. GI problems, headache um, are common symptoms. Joint pain can be a common symptom of histamine release. Remember, histamine is what causes the symptoms of allergy response. We get histamine release. It's a normal chemical that our immune cells produce. And so it doesn't necessarily even have to be histamine intolerance. There's some people that are histamine intolerant, but it could just be histamine. The histamine burden is too great. And your body doesn't have the capacity to, to deal with that. And so these are, again, the symptoms. So if you look up here in this diagram, you'll see a lot of the respiratory symptoms that people associate with seasonal allergies, runny nose, Okay, inflammation of the nasal passages, congestion, shortness of breath. You know, other symptoms can be watery or teary or itchy eyes, coughing, wheezing, sneezing, right? The, the typical things that people struggle with. And so a lot of people jump to these over-the-counter kind of drug-like remedies, like things like NyQuil and, and uh, congestion aids. Again, those don't come without a price. And if you're gluten-sensitive... So key here, if you are gluten sensitive and you're jumping to these over the counters, you're going to get in trouble because OTC allergy remedies contain gluten. Almost every single one I've ever looked at over the counter contains some form of gluten. So the problem with that is, is if you're having symptoms of allergy and you jump to this right here and you're getting gluten exposure, you might get minuscule or, or minimized benefit from using these, these types of therapies, aside from the fact that these types of therapies largely suppress the immune system, which isn't a great idea to begin with, but you get gluten. And that's key, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, so keep that in your mind. You can see some of the other symptoms here, headaches, migraines, dizziness, okay, tachycardia, which is a heightened or increased heart rate, and then hypotonia, collapsing or passing out, uh, menstrual cramps. Ladies, you didn't maybe think that histamine exposure during allergy season could make your cycles more aggressive and worse, but it's a very, very common thing that happens. And then we get GI symptoms, the bloating, the flatulence, the fullness, the potential for diarrhea and pain, constipation, nausea, vomiting, and then as well with the skin. A lot of times seasonal allergies manifest in the skin, the inflammatory aspects of what can go on with the skin. So some people develop uterocarial wheels or flushing of the skin or just generalized inflammation and swelling of the skin. So again, a lot of people and a lot of doctors really predominantly focus here, right? They focus maybe a little bit here um, under dizziness because that sometimes is, is, is more considered. And then they focus, uh, for the most part, around um, nausea uh, and vomiting, and then that facial symptoms, the itchy 
teary stuff. So again, it's deeper than that. And a histamine reaction from an environmental allergy, seasonal allergy can cause any number of these different symptoms to develop. And so again, if you're gluten sensitive and you're using the over-the-counter allergy meds, you're gonna run into problems because they contain gluten. Now, what's interesting about that is we look at, uh, at this research study, non-responsive celiac disease. So what does that mean? That means that people have gone gluten-free, right? And they did not respond to the diet. And one of the reasons why these, guys, these doctors studied that is because additional food intolerance, malabsorption, including histamine intolerance. So what, let's, let's, let's first, let's look at what they had to say. Histamine intolerance was found in more than 50% of their patients, and it seems to play an important role in non-responsive celiac disease. So again, going back to if you are gluten-free and you're not responding, one of, the, one of the findings of these doctors is that more than half, right? So one half have an, have an issue with histamine intolerance, I meaning they can't tolerate more histamine. Now, what happens during allergy season is we're exposed to all these environmental agents, the, the pollens, the, the molds, the dust, the dander, the things that, that happen during the spring. And we already have a poor ability to deal with histamines, okay? And so the overwhelm comes, right? So we get exposure to much, much more environmental uh, environmental exposures that trigger histamine release. And so, whereas maybe now, if you think about this as your, as your histamine bucket, your body can only take so much. So if this is your histamine bucket and you're gluten sensitive and you have a histamine intolerance already, because half of you do, your bucket's full. So imagine, or it's, it's, kind of to the top, if that's the level, right? And then allergy season kicks in and we get all these stimulus or stimuli that increase the bucket further. And so what happens is it then starts to overspill. And when it overspills, this is when we develop the severity of symptoms, right? So we got too much histamine, we can't break it down. And so if histamine is a vasoactive amine that causes all the symptoms that we associate with allergic response, with allergies, right? And so again, but if it's happening in the spring, then, then you know, even if, even if you're eating gluten-free, again, you may not deal with histamine very well. And so the spring, it kind of overloads your system. So it's a common issue in people with gluten sensitivity. Now, I wanna point something else out. If you're having symptoms year round, you don't have allergies. This is, I get this a lot. People say, yeah, I take my allergy medicine every day and I've been taking it every day for five years or 10 years or fill in the blank. You don't have an allergy problem. You've got a food problem and you have an immune system problem. You shouldn't have to suppress your immune system 365 days a year just to survive the day without having severity of allergy-like symptoms. So if your symptoms are year round, uh, and they're not cyclical, they're not su uh, spring and they're not fall, you have an immune problem, not an allergy problem. And you've been, basically, you've most likely have been misdiagnosed and you've been told the wrong things. And again, why is this so important? Because many of the drugs that people use to cope with year-round allergies are right here. Over-the-counter allergy remedies. And guess what? Again, they a lot of them contain gluten and so now you're gluten sensitive you already maybe have a problem with histamines you're reacting all year round so you're using a medicine that contains gluten in it so you're glutening yourself in an effort to defend yourself from the symptoms that haven't gone away because nobody's told you the truth about why your symptoms actually exist so it's super important that you that you understand that connection especially between gluten sensitivity and histamine and allergies so Immune problems versus seasonal allergies. If your symptoms are year round, you got an immune problem. If you find yourself reacting aggressively to foods, you have an allergy problem and you have an immune problem. If your symptoms are largely in the GI tract, we generally tend to think food uh, more aggressively. If you've got generalized muscle joint pain, stiffness, then again, food, we think of food because it's going systemically. Now, what should you do? How do you, how do you go about figuring this out if you 
are in this situation. Now, number one thing that you can do is get tested for food sensitivity. It's, it's probably the best thing you can absolutely do because a lot of times what happens, remember going back to, to um, what we said here, if your bucket's already full and it only takes a little bit and now you throw in, again, you throw in some foods that you're reactive to here, And you have, you know, environmental stuff over here. And, and so those things are coming in and then you're still eating foods that you're reactive to. This bucket just spills over. You get aggressive symptoms. So this is why testing for food. Why? Because if we test for food and we know what to remove from the diet, then we take away that component. We can't control the environmental component. You're, you know, the season is the season. You're going to have things in the air. Now, you certainly you can filter your air and you can stay indoors on high allergy count, high spore count days. You certainly can take that and have that behavioral activity around protecting yourself the best that you can, but food you can control. And so testing allows you to then manipulate your diet so that this bucket, you're taking away one of the inputs, right? And that's going to lower that level so that when allergy season is here, you've got more room to fill that bucket. You've got, that bucket can hold more and you become less apt to develop aggressive symptoms because that's what happens to a lot of people who went too far. Um, a lot of people get stuck in this, in this place here where they're symptomatic year round and they don't know what they should or shouldn't eat. And even this is beyond gluten because again, gluten sensitivity could be part of this issue, but it may also not be just gluten. I've seen people that were allergic to broccoli and cauliflower. I mean, healthy foods, superfoods, you can still be allergic to. So this is important. So food sensitivity and food allergy testing, get it done. Get it done so that you can manipulate your diet. You also can check one of the other big things I see very, very commonly if it's year round is mold in the home. So it's like home exposure. You live at home, right? And your, your home is your haven. It's your safe place. And if your home has mold in it and you're being constantly exposed to mold, mold is going to be one of those environmental things. It's just filling up your histamine bucket and really getting you to overload. Is that, this actually happened to me in, in my house. Um, we had, we lost our house. At, at, at what, at what happened was we were, we were, um, Finding I was particularly my eyes would just itch. I'd lay down in bed at night and I would sneeze for a little while and my eyes would just itch. They were on fire. You know, I, you know, I'm a, generally I, I'd like to think I'm a healthy person, but it wouldn't just it just wouldn't stop. Right. And what we actually ended up finding out is that we had a major mold issue in our home. And once we dealt with that, got out of the exposure. OK, then the eyes completely cleared up the allergy symptoms completely recovered, which is, you know, ideal. Uh, the other thing you want to do here is get tested for vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but there are certain vitamins and certain uh, minerals that are important for your body's ability to be able to break histamine down. So remember, histamine is a chemical your immune system makes in response to allergic exposure. And if your histamine levels are too high, you'll become very symptomatic. So the solution is Take away the things that are driving the histamine exposure, number one, and number two, make sure you have adequate nutrients so that you can break histamine down. Your body naturally has the ability to break histamine down, and that requires certain vitamins and minerals. So getting tested there uh, becomes important if you, want to, if you want to minimize, again, your symptoms and exposure long term. Now, as I said before um, about medicines, medicines suppress the immune system. And this can be a problem uh, for many of you in many different ways. So like, again, what I was saying earlier is that many of the medicines um, contain gluten. So that's one problem with them. And if you're gluten sensitive, this is going to hammer your immune system, right? It's going to affect your immune system. So this is more commonly the over-the-counter antihistamines that we'll see this with, okay. Steroids, and these are, these are prescription, the steroids are severely immunosuppressive, right? So they, again, they suppress the immune system, but they also reduce your vitamin C, they reduce your magnesium, they reduce your zinc, your, your vitamin D, 
and they reduce calcium. So you, you end up, you know, if you're on a steroid inhaler for asthma, seasonal or, or not seasonal, year round, right? You're depleting these nutrients using that medication. Every one of these nutrients is, is important for how your immune system responds, reacts, and behaves. And deficiencies of these nutrients are linked to long-term immune problems and greater degrees of consequences. So even though the medicine initially gives you this symptom relief, right? What do you trade? When you take the medicine to get symptom relief, you're trading the symptom relief for these deficiencies. And so what ends up happening is that these deficiencies, because they're so important with how your immune system functions, you end up having chronic allergy struggles because the, even though you're getting symptomatic relief temporarily, depleting these nutrients leads to chronic immune problems and even in many cases can lead to progression of immune problems to the level of the development of autoimmune disease. And you don't want that either. That's bad news. So um, let's look at, at this study here. This actually, it's a review, um, but I want to point a few things out. Antihistamines, decongestants, anticholinergic agents, and corticosteroid therapy or steroids, okay, alone or in combination are typically used in the treatment of allergic rhinitis, reported adverse side effects, include sedation, impaired learning or memory, as well as cardiac arrhythmias. And that's not all, especially with the steroids can raise your blood pressure. The steroids can also suppress uh, long-term again, suppression of the immune system itself. And uh, steroids can also cause elevations in blood sugar and elevations in blood sugar, not good. That's a precondition to diabetes and weight gain. So you don't want that either, right? Because excessive sugar in your bloodstream suppresses your immune system even further. So again, this is what you this is what you're trading. You're trading for that steroid, for that over the counter. You're either trading gluten exposure. You're trading these symptoms plus these nutritional deficiencies, leading to chronic immune issues that can occur. Now, you see here as this article goes on, oops, we lost it. Let's pull it back up. Here we go. As this article goes on to state. Therapeutic strategies should seek to decrease the morbidity already associated with this condition. Urtica dioica, which is stinging nettle. If you've ever heard of stinging nettle, that's just another way to say it. Bromelain, which is, a, which is an anti-inflammatory proteolytic enzyme. Quercetin, which is a bioflavonoid. Many of you have heard about quercetin recently with, you know, with the virus, right? Quercetin is a, is a zinc ionophore. And then NAC, NAC, and vitamin C are safe natural therapies that may be used as primary therapy or in conjunction with conventional methods. What this our review article did is it reviewed all of the literature, all the medical research on using these natural alternatives as it relates to chronic allergic rhinitis, meaning allergy symptoms. And there's so much literature on this topic. I mean, uh, we could do months of shows on the level of evidence research that shows that these nutrients are supportive of the immune system and help with allergies. A lot of this stuff doesn't make it to lay press uh, or doesn't make it to mainstream media, in my opinion, because mainstream media is pretty much bought and paid for by pharma. I mean, that's just the reality. Turn on the TV. All you got to do is watch the commercials. 80 to 90 percent of commercials on the news and the nightly news are pharma commercials, regular TV. Um, it, you, that's, that's just what you're bombarded with. So anyway, nutrients, very, very critical. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, I want to talk about other causes of histamine reaction. Now, we did a show, a full show on histamines, but I want you to be aware that if you struggle with seasonal allergies, you should be aware that there are other things that can cause histamine dysregulation, how your body processes histamine. So we have food, we have bacterial imbalances. You need a healthy microbiome. That's why certain antibiotics can actually make people more sensitive to histamine. So why is that a problem? Because most people, when they go to the doctor and they're, they're running, their nose is running, they got a headache, they're stuffy. Look, those are symptoms of allergy. If the doctor thinks instead that you have an infection, and gives you an antibiotic, he's creating a bacterial imbalance to treat what he thinks might be an infection, but actually what might be just symptoms of histamine. And he's making the histamine issue worse by creating a greater bacterial imbalance. We see the same thing with GI inflammation. Um, 
when your gut's on fire, there are a number of different components within your gut, one of them being the gut lining itself. And so histamine is a chemical, obviously, that, that um, it, it causes permeability in the gut. So think of it as causing leaky gut, right? So histamine can lead to that leaky gut. And what that does is it opens up your gut lining to all kinds of, of nefarious bacterial byproducts and other toxins that are found in your food and allows that to get into your bloodstream. And when that hits your bloodstream, that puts pressure on your immune system to cope and deal with it. So your immune system becomes preoccupied with dealing with components of leaky gut. It doesn't have the resources to also deal with the massive amount of spring or, or fall allergies that you might also be struggling with. But Remember, one of the normal responses to food allergy is histamine release in the gut. And so that's where that GI inflammation can come from. Nutritional deficiencies, I'm going to come back to that one. We talked about some of this already with medications, again, at antibiotics being an example, but there certainly are other medications that can contribute to histamine intolerance, even outside of that, like your, anti, uh, your antihistamines, your acid-blocking medications can cause, you know, if you're taking like um, proton pump inhibitors, PPIs, uh, drugs like uh, Protonix and Nexium and Prilosec um, can all impact how your body can deal with histamine. And then menstrual cycle, hormonal changes along the menstrual cycle can make a person more apt to be histamine intolerant. So it makes women a little bit, sometimes a little bit more susceptible. Now there's some things you can do here, especially with foods. These are, so this list is a list of histamine rich foods. So during allergy season, if you really struggle, you might want to consider changing your diet during this time. So, you know, maybe not a permanent diet change, but just look at avoidance of these things during allergy season to see if that doesn't help with your symptoms. Super simple thing to change. Um, it's just a handful of things. It's not like a massive list of foods. Now, so you got this list, which are foods that are high in histamine. So again, they would serve to help increase your histamine bucket and then you have these foods down here which are not high in histamine but they can trigger histamine release so again you can you can look at again during allergy season avoiding those potentials and then there are foods that inhibit this enzyme called DAO DAO stands for diamine oxidase what is this this is an enzyme and this enzyme breaks down histamine. So it helps your body get rid of excess of histamine. And so these different agents here inhibit your body's ability naturally to break histamine down. And remember, we want to break that histamine down. That's how we become asymptomatic. It's when the histamine levels become too high that we, and we can't handle it. So alcohols, fermented drinks, teas, and then energy drinks. So these are all things that, that can do that. And so you just have to be careful around it because a lot of you do a lot of these things, you know, and don't even, aren't even necessarily maybe aware that that's part of why you're struggling. But those are simple changes you can make during allergy season. Let's talk next about some of the nutrients. And there are a number of key nutrients that can be very, very helpful. And I've mentioned a few of them already. Vitamin C gets a gold star, though, in my opinion, a white star in this case. But... Um, Hands down, one of the most well-studied natural antihistamine nutrients alive, period, right, in, in history. Zinc, zinc and vitamin A, these two not so much antihistamine, but they support immune function. So they help to regulate the strength of the immune response. The immune system response has to be controlled. If it's out of control, it'll overreact. And when it overreacts, you won't just make histamine, you'll make leukotrienes and prostaglandins and other chemicals that also cause inflammation and symptoms very similar to histamine. And so you've got to make sure you've got enough of these coming in as well. And then you have NAC. NAC, N-acetylcysteine. A lot of you are worried about NAC right now because there's, a, there's been a worldwide shortage and then there's also talk about the government restricting your ability to get NAC. Just to update on that, as it stands right now, there's no laws being passed. There, there's just a conversation being had. So um, we, have, we have NAC. We have the ability to get NAC. It's not restricted as of today, as of today's date. And then omega-3. Omega-3 is very important because it stabilizes the cell membrane. So if you look at a cell, the membrane around that cell, this, this structure right here, has to be stable. If it's not stable, 
what, it, what can end up happening is this membrane in your white blood cells, and this is particularly in your white blood cells like your mast cells, right, or your eosinophils. These are specialized white blood cells that release histamine. So what happens is when these cells have an unstable cell membrane, they break open too easy, and those chemicals, the histamine is released a lot more aggressively. And so we would consider really omega-3 as, as what's called a mast cell stabilizer. It helps to stabilize the membrane around the cell so that it's less apt to just spew out all of its chemical ingredients at the drop of something allergic. So again, we want that omega-3 as a stabilizing agent. And then quercetin, one, when you combine quercetin and vitamin C, they actually work in the same location in your cell membrane. There are different chemicals, and one of them is, is called cyclooxygenase. Um, and, and another is called arachidonic acid, but these chemicals are vitamin C and quercetin when combined work to help re reduce the amount of inflammation that's released when that cell membrane breaks open, not just from histamine, but from other chemicals as well. So that's actually the way steroids work. Steroids work in that same manner by inhibiting the release of aggressive inflammation when a cell membrane ruptures. And so vitamin C and, and quercetin work in that same location, aside from some of the other impacts. But quercetin is also a bioflavonoid that improves the uptake of zinc into your cells. So quercetin enhances the zinc that you're using. It works synergistically with it. And then zinc enhances vitamin A. So you need quercetin to absorb zinc into the cell. You need vitamin you need zinc to absorb vitamin A to get vitamin A where it's going. Zinc produces a chemical called RBP, retinal binding protein, and that, that's what binds on to retinol, which is what vitamin A is, and it carries it, taxicabs it through your bloodstream to deposit it into tissue. So these things are all important and all necessary for strong, healthy immune system response. But tonight I wanted to focus a little bit more on vitamin C because vitamin C is something you should all have access to. You should all understand just how powerful it works and how well it works. Before we get directly into that, I want to talk a little bit too about, about histamine in general. So I, without being too complicated, this is histamine here. Let's change colors. Um, let's do... So here's histamine. And it's derived from the amino acid histidine. And so what happens is you, when you make histamine or release histamine, it can be broken down. There are different pathways where which it can be broken down. It can go this direction. It can go this direction. This is one of the most, to the left, is one of the most important directions. And this requires that enzyme. Remember I said earlier that diamine oxidase, that's the enzyme that helps break histamine down. You make a lot of this enzyme in your gut. So, so again, you also have it in your bloodstream, but you make a lot of it in your guts. This is very important to understand. This is how, when we're being exposed to food allergens, a lot of times the histamine response within the gut, DAO can help with that breakdown. Now, you come over here, you're gonna see this. DAO requires, for it to work, it needs copper, which is a mineral, it needs vitamin C, and it needs vitamin B6. Okay, so you need copper, vitamin C, and vitamin B6. Without those three nutrients, again, vitamin C, right, which we're talking about, this enzyme won't be activated and you won't be efficient at breaking histamine down. And so that histamine level will potentially will increase. Now, we also use gut bacteria to break histamine down. And this is what I was talking about earlier. A lot of times you go to the doctor, you've got seasonal allergic symptoms. They think you have an infection. They give you an antibiotic. You wipe out your gut flora and you leave yourself hanging. So imagine now, imagine you're vitamin C and copper deficient. You got allergy symptoms. You get an antibiotic. They knock out your gut bacteria. That only really leaves you with one way to get rid of histamine. And a lot of people here with this HNMT, which is a histamine in methyl transferase, it's an enzyme that breaks and degrades down histamine. A lot of people have single nucleotide polymorphisms are genetic mutations where they don't do that effectively or efficiently. And so they're at a disadvantage. And so now it's like a trifecta. All the ways you can get rid of histamine are either genetically compromised or they're dietarily or drug compromised. And so here you are left with nothing but a bucket full of histamine causing a severity of reaction. So again, 
you know, this is what I was talking about earlier with copper, vitamin C, vitamin B6, nutrients necessary to degrade histamine. So coming back to, um, I think I showed you this already, but again, stinging nettle, bromelain, quercetin, NAC, and vitamin C are some of the safest, most natural antihistamine nutrition that you can bring into your body to help with this. So especially if you've done antibiotics and you can't undo them once you've done them, if you have a genetic SNP for that and, and you have low levels of nutrients, these are things, again, that can be used to help your body degrade and to re, re, um, regulate the inflammation caused as a result of that histamine response. Now, I wanted to focus, I told you I was going to focus a little bit on some of the antihistamine effects of vitamin C. And uh, one of the great researchers in this area is C.S. Johnston has done a ton of research in this area, but just kind of paraphrasing some of the studies here. So the, the data indicate that blood histamine and plasma-free carnitine are altered in individuals with subnormal non-scorbutic vitamin C status. So basically, people with low vitamin C have higher blood histamine. And then this study also published antihistamine effect of supplemental ascorbic acid and neutrophil chemotaxis, which is how neutrophils move around. But the bottom line is histamine levels depressed 38% um, following vitamin C supplementation, meaning that when, when patients took vitamin C, it reduced histamine levels 38%. That's pretty impressive for something that you don't need a prescription for, that you can buy over the counter. And actually, I would argue that's probably more impressive than what you're going to get out of a lot of the over-the-counter remedies and medicines. And then you can see here, I, I showed you this earlier as well, but um, I, I want to highlight it again for those of you who are struggling with a gluten issue. And maybe you're not really, maybe you don't know whether or not you're gluten sensitive. In which case, if you, if you suspect that you might have it, take our quiz. Um, we'll, we'll drop a link into the feed. Look, it's a simple quiz. It's free. Take it. If, if you answer the questions, uh, you know, you'll get an answer as to whether or not there's a suspicion you might be gluten sensitive. If that quiz comes back and it's a yes, right, then you might consider getting genetically tested for gluten sensitivity and rule it out because, again, a lot of people struggle with seasonal allergies because they're also eating gluten. And a lot of people with gluten sensitivity don't take their diet seriously enough and they fail to recover, right? And that's because one of the side effects of gluten exposure, it's not, gluten exposure can also lead to histamine uh, release in the GI tract. And so that's another, just another important element of gluten. Okay, moving through a few more of these here. So this one, and this one's on intravenous vitamin C. Some people ask, you know, what about IV vitamin C? Now, if you have the means and you have the, the resource in your area, you know, some people say, well, can I, what's better, oral vitamin C or IV vitamin C? I honestly, I think bang for buck, oral vitamin C is better, but you can also do IV. If you've got a good doctor who's willing to do IV vitamin C, you can do IV vitamin C. In this study, here's what they found. Our observations suggest that treatment with intravenous high-dose vitamin C reduces allergy-related symptoms. This was a study done by these doctors on 71 of their patients uh, and found that allergy symptoms reduced quite, quite well with vitamin C. And then we have a couple more to show you here on this one. So this one is antihistamine effects and complications of supplement, uh, supplemental vitamin C. It just, I'll just point out a couple of things that, um, so this author of this paper uh, was citing another author by the name of Chatterjee, who's a, who's a, a, a pretty, um, a pretty well-known figure in nutritional research as it relates to nutritional immunology. So Chatterjee et al. have postulated that ascorbate mobilization during stress may be a natural defense mechanism for the detoxification of excess histamine. So basically, they believe that, that the body releases more of the stored vitamin C to combat excessive uh, histamine release. And I've actually seen this in a number of people with chronicity of allergy response, where when we look at their vitamin C levels, they're on the floor. Like they, they don't have storage of vitamin C, even their serum vitamin C levels, which you know, I, don't, I don't recommend serum measurement as a great degree of accuracy, but we've seen this trend where both serum and intracellular levels are super, super low, and those individuals struggle tremendously with allergies. And you see chronic administration, so what does chronic mean? It means, it means daily over time. 
uh, but, but regular administration of two grams of ascorbate per day has significantly lowered blood histamine levels by 40% in healthy adults. 40% is a pretty darn good reduction in histamine if you're overloaded and overburdened. And then I thought I wanted to bring this one up because I just thought this study was, was interesting because some of you, this might kill two birds with one stone. Some of you might struggle with seasickness. So you get on a boat, you get, you get ill. Well, there's research that shows that one of the reasons that seasickness is caused is because of a histamine release. And so this, this, what's interesting about this study is they were using vitamin C to combat high histamine as a result of seasickness. And here's what they found. Some of the data show that vitamin C is effective in suppressing symptoms of seasickness particularly in women and men younger than 27 years of age. So I, can, I think the takeaway here is if you're young and you struggle with seasickness, you might consider taking vitamin C next time you go on a boat, next time you go on a cruise, and it, you might just get some benefit from it. And again, that works because seasickness is, is one of those things that can be induced by histamine release. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your questions. Let's see what we got tonight. Uh, let's see. Deanne says, my, sister's has ha my sister has had plugged cracking ears. The station tube won't drain since October after COVID. Food sensitivities and tolerances tasted, uh, tested, I assume, not tasted. Um, diet is no sugar, no dairy, no gluten, no alcohol, and an attempt to lower inflammation if that's the cause. Also sees a chiropractor twice a week. Ears do get adjusted each time. Still no relief. Any suggestions? Mold. You, you might have a mold, environmental mold issue, especially with the cracking. I, I've seen that a number of times in, in people where the, the ear, the skin um, is cracking. And I'll see it too. The, the palms and the feet, the skin on the palms and feet will start to crack. Um, but that would be something I would check for. I mean, the other thing you might attempt too is some of the supplementation um, that we talked about tonight, supporting her with higher doses of vitamin C um, and, and, and even a combination of things like NAC, quercetin, nettle, vitamin C. Those things work synergistically together. So doing one by itself might not work as, as well as taking them all in combination with each other. How can you tell the difference between a cold and allergy symptoms? It's hard. It's tough because they're very, very similar. Um, and some people will say, you know, the difference sometimes can be a fever. Um, but sometimes allergy symptoms can also cause a fever. So I don't, I don't necessarily wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, some people would say that a cold, generally, if it's if it's a if it's a cold it will be precipitated by a few days of extreme fatigue and muscular um, aches and pains, and then the cold sets in. Um, although, I, I, again, I would say that you can't rely on that 100% either. The best way objectively to tell the difference is a cold. If it's a cold, your body, if your body's in relatively good shape, you're going to see, you should see symptomatic change and improvement within a week or two. And it shouldn't persist and go on. If it's an allergy issue, you know the allergy symptoms themselves might persist in a much longer fashion. Um, I mean, you can go and also get testing done where they run what's called a complete blood count in your doctor's office, and they're looking at, you know, the elevations of certain types of white blood cells. Oftentimes, with a cold, you'll see elevations of neutrophils, whereas with allergies, you'll see elevation of a of a cell type called an eosinophil. But you have to be careful with that interpretation too, because that's not always true. A lot of times you don't see those elevations. And, and that's in, in a lot of ways because the people that are being tested sometimes are already immunosuppressed because they're on other medicines and those medicines have reduced their white counts overall anyway. So it, it, it's one of those that it's, there's not a perfect answer. I wish I could give you better than that, but it really it's a discerning doc who can look at, at all those different factors and help you make a call. What are my thoughts on using a neti pot? I like neti pots. I think, I, I think one, first of all, if you're using a neti pot, it sh you shouldn't be using a neti pot if you have the problem year round. Like you shouldn't have to use a neti pot every day. Again, if you're doing it for seasonal allergy time to kind of drain and rinse out your sinuses from the potential for allergenic debris getting clogged in your, in your mucus, it's great. 
But if you have to use a neti pot every day just to breathe, you've got a deeper immune problem. So, but I like neti pots. I think they're very effective and, and very helpful. Let's see. What's the best test for mold? Depends. Um, if you're trying to rule out mold, like environmental mold allergy, there's a handful of tests where you're looking at different antibodies to different species of mold. So if you're trying to figure out whether or not you're having an allergic response to mold, um, IgA, IgG, and IgE antibody tests for all the different species of mold is, is helpful. Now, if you're talking about not so remember mold is, is like a trifecta with with mold you can be allergic to mold but not everyone is but but you can also be being poisoned by mold toxins which are a very different beast altogether and in my opinion the best way to understand whether that's happening is to do mycotoxin testing and um and that will give you an indication of whether or not you're being exposed to the toxins that mold produces in high enough quantities to to create an immunosuppression effect and then the third aspect to mold is mold growing inside your body like a yeast or a candida overgrowth. And there are different ways to test for that too. So like if you're talking about like mold growing in the sinus cavities, a nasal culture swab, the key with the swab is they need to hold on to it for at least a month before they just uh, stop it. A lot of doctors, you go to an ENT or a, an allergy specialist, they might do a culture. And a lot of times they culture it for, you know, 48 hours, a couple of days, and then if they don't see mold growing, they throw the culture away and call it a negative culture. But you really have to hold on to a culture if you're trying to find mold um, for at least a month. And if you're, again, you have to have that conversation with the doctor doing the test to make sure they're not throwing that culture away too quickly. Um, other ways to test for, for mold or candida growing inside of you is, is you can do um, a stool sample. There are stool sampling tests that can measure that. And then there are also antibody tests to different species of candida that you can also have run. So there are different, different ways that you can go about mold, just depending on which, which one of those areas you're referring to. How do you regain a sense of smell? What supplements or vitamin nutrients work? You know, one of the things people don't realize about smell is olfactory, which is what smell is, you got you know, primary nerve that extends off your brain that, that feeds your nose. Um, so this is your smell, but, and it's also an olfactory, and then you have another cranial nerve that feeds your tongue and your taste. So smell, but smell and taste are both related. So these two are related. Um, predominantly smell allows us to taste, okay? And this is why a lot of people that get the, the, the cold find that they lose their smell and their taste or things will just taste funny and one of the reasons why is this when you get sick your body sequesters zinc and it starts using that zinc because zinc is an, one of the most powerful antivirals known to man it does more to inhibit viral replication and viral uptake and viral loading than any other nutrient and so what happens when you get sick is your body burns through that zinc and because you burn through that zinc, you can be left in a state where you can't taste or smell. Now, some people, what, what I've seen resolve, and the quickest I've seen it resolve is like a day or two, is high doses of quercetin, you know, one to three grams a day, which is really high, right? And then 100 to 150 milligrams that's a five per day of zinc. The quercetin is going to help get the zinc into the cell. The zinc is going to, it, it plays a role in osmoreceptors in your nose and it helps them function. And so again, a lot of people are just extremely depleted of zinc post, post that cold. So you get these two things going. This is one of the most effective and natural ways to support olfaction and taste. Now, beyond that, you, you know, some people, it doesn't work. There are some people where that method doesn't do what we wanted it to do. And there are several reasons why and several theories why, but one of them is that, that, um, that the virus itself can damage nerve tissue 
And so that nerve tissue, if it's damaged, can take a little bit longer to heal, actually a lot bit longer, you know, six, eight, nine months for some people. So it could just be time as well. So if the question is zinc, don't solve it relatively quickly. You might have a little bit of nerve damage here, which then you'll want to support your nerve health. One of the things I've also seen work to do this, to support that is choline citrate, which I've talked about here, especially recently, I did an entire show on choline, but choline prompts the, the turns on, you have to understand that smell and taste are part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And choline is the primary chemical that drives this system to help you smell, taste, digest, rest, heal, repair. So this can also be something that oftentimes has to happen. The other thing we see is, is post, especially if you ran a high fever for many days, is we see severity of electrolyte imbalance. So what are the electrolytes? And I'm not just talking about sodium and chloride, which is what most people talk about or think about. Magnesium is an electrolyte, calcium is an electrolyte. So you have to, getting those things measured, right? And a lot of times the choline actually with magnesium can be even more effective uh, in some cases. So these are just ideas for you to maybe attempt and try uh, if you still struggle with, with a lack of taste or smell. Can you take larger amount of omega-3 than the bottle states? Well, I mean, I, I don't know, Deanne, it depends on which bottle you're referring to. Um, you know, different bottles, different, different doses. You t I mean, you can take a lot of omega-3. I mean, there, there are studies, and we, we've actually done it, um, you know, up to eight grams a day of omega-3. Your cue for omega-3, your limit is if you, you know, one of the things that we can see when the dose gets high enough or too high is you'll see spontaneous nosebleed. So the nose will just bleed without whacking it, without any trauma, you'll, you'll, your nose will start bleeding. I have seen that happen with really, really mega doses of omega-3. But I would suggest if you're thinking about taking in much larger amounts, you get your levels checked. You can do a, what's called an omega check test that measures the omega-3 concentration of your cell membranes. And a simple test, but it'll kind of give you guidance as to where you're at. And what you're looking for on a test like that is you want to get your level between 8 and 12% um, is what you're looking for in terms of omega-3 levels in your, in your blood, in your, in your membranes, in your cells of your blood. Um, does IV vitamin C contain pesticides? That's a really good question. I don't think anybody's, I don't, I've never seen a study come across where they've looked at IV vitamin C as whether or not they contain pesticides. I mean, that would really be, in my opinion, a, a question you ask the doctor who wants to administer it is what is the source of the IV vitamin C, where is it coming from? What is the raw ingredient source? You know, is it organic? Like these are questions that you want to ask. Just like you ask questions about your food, you should ask those same types of questions about anything that you bypass your mouth and directly inject into your body. Okay, let's see here. So um, Gaia says, non, I'm, non, I'm non-celiac gluten sensitivity with autoimmune disease. Would, would it be an option to eat occasional grains checking or reading antibodies, IgA, IgM, and IgG? No, it wouldn't be, not unless you want to guarantee a failure to recover. I mean, especially if you've got uh, already an existing autoimmune disease, you're just, it's a ticking time bomb. You're just pouring fuel on the fire. Porcine kidney powder, where does that fit with histamine reduction, Lisa's asking. So there's a, a porcine kidney powder that contains concentrated amounts of DAO. Again, DAO, diamine oxidase, will break down histamine. So a lot of people are using porcine kidney powder because of its high levels, okay, its, its, its strong levels of DAO in an effort to try to break histamine down. I would, I would say you can do that, but if that porcine kidney powder is not, if it's not standardized to contain a certain amount of DAO, um, you know, you don't really know what you're getting in terms of quantity of DAO. And if you're trying to solve an issue, uh, solve a problem, you really want to know, okay, if there's a certain dose that you have to hit. Because what I see some people do, depending on their, the product, where they buy it, if it's inferior, if it doesn't have adequate DAO in it, they think, oh, I used that porcine kidney powder stuff. It didn't work for me. But what really it could have been 
is that they used it, but it, because it wasn't standardized to contain DAO as a, as a certain dose, DAO to keep it active you, it is a very meticulous process. And so it's why a lot of those DAO supplements can be a little bit more expensive. And so what some, what some people have done is just said, well, I'm just gonna use porcine kidney powder instead of that supplement in an attempt to try to get the same effect. And look, if you do that and you have the same effect, good for you, but if you do it and you don't, it may not be because the uh, the supplement shouldn't have worked. It may be because it just wasn't standardized con to contain enough DAO. Uh, let's see, I was negative for a mold test. I, I assume you mean a swab. Uh, was positive for a small amount of coagulase negative staff, had COVID for six or six months ago using X clear and colloidal silver. Any other suggestions? Neti pot would be good and a good strong probiotic. You, you also want to support recolonization of, the, of, your, of your sinus cavities and, and GI tract. Uh, let's see, are these vitamins available through your office? Um, which ones do you mean? If you're talking about vitamin C, all of the, every, every vitamin I'm talking about, more specifically, they're available through Gluten-Free Society. I mean, if, you, if you're working with me in my office, they're available, but we don't, my office, my practice doesn't sell to the general public, but Gluten-Free Society does. Are lentils gluten-free? Yes, they are definitely, they are gluten-free. Um, let's see, keep going down there. Okay, so are there, well, let's see here. Have you ever used, let's see. So a couple of off topic questions. Let's see, let's go to, we may come back to those. The B vitamins also help with allergies and food sensitivities. Indirectly, they help because they help they help your body's biochemistry, and B vitamins particularly help your methylation, and they help your um, you know your your serotonin and your dopamine pathways. Um, they also help your adrenaline pathways function properly. So, but not directly. Um, food allergies. My 13 and 15 year olds are suffering Texas allergies. We've tried everything and nothing has worked. Unfortunately, even his assist. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, there, there are a, there's a company in Texas and they produce a homeopathic remedy specifically for the allergies in Texas. And so um, you might just look, Nicole, you might look up homeopathic allergy remedies specific to Texas, and you should be able to find that. It's a, I can try to remember the name of the company specifically, but I, I, I can't remember the name of the company. It's just, it's falling off my tongue. But that's what I would try that search because that may also work very, very effectively. The other thing that you might consider if histesis didn't work is dosing stronger, like higher doses. The, the recommended amount on, a, on the bottle is about four caps a day, but you know we sometimes get people up to eight, 10 caps a day is where we'll, we sometimes start seeing relief. So I don't know if you've done that at that level, but that might be something else that you push to see. I think, so Betty's asking, I think my, my sauerkraut is my only high histamine food and I gave it up for a month with no improvement. Should I stop only using your histocyst, which was doing great? Um, yeah, I mean, if you're finding that, that sauerkraut exacerbates your issues, sometimes, you know, fermented food can do that. You know, it doesn't do it in everybody. But again, if you're finding it exacerbates your issue, definitely not a bad idea to give it up. Can I have a reaction or sensitivity with zero detectable allergies? I've started iodine trying to deal with a chemical. So yeah, you can, but again, if you don't have any detectable allergies, I would, I would argue as to the methodology at which you were tested, Zulu, because if you, if, if you were tested you know, in a limited fashion, which is what happens to a lot of people, they go into their doctor and they get, um, they get tested, but what they get is something called a skin prick. And the problem with the skin prick is it generally what it is, it's proclaiming the measure is an IgE response, 
which is a type of one of the four types of antibodies that, that can manifest with the food reaction. The problem with the skin prick is they're pokey with metal, which you could be allergic to, and they but they wipe you down, they wipe your skin down. with corn alcohol. So if you have a corn issue, and so we'll see on these, on these skin prick tests, we get a lot of false positive. That's common. Now, we also get false negative because they're not super accurate. And so you can measure allergies in a lot of different ways, but IgE in the blood is one way to measure what's known as an acute allergy response. There's also IgG, there's IgM, there's IgA, there's something called an immune complex, and then there's a, what's known as a T-cell response, direct T-cell response. And so most people, you know, again, this is all they get. And so you're left with your hand like not having any of that measured accurately, you're going to get false negatives. And so, again, depending on how you were tested, I would just say you might talk with your doctor about testing more comprehensively if you hadn't already had all those things done. What system do you use for food sensitivities? It's not a system. Um, it's methodologies, and there are multiple methodologies. There's not one. So I, I, I kind of just explained that. Um, Susan um, on the board there. Is histocyst only to be used during pollen periods? No, I mean, I have some people that use it, you know, that use it even away from pollen periods because they want to keep their dog or their cat. And so they just love their animals so much, but they're allergic to their animal and they want to hold on to them anyway. And so they use histocyst in an attempt to minimize or mitigate their histamine response uh, because of a furry loved one. My histamine was normal and my tyramine was high. Serotonin syndrome, taking riboflavin and vitamin C to address serotonin syndrome and break down tyrosine, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would agree with your analysis. I'd get a, I'd get a more in detail workup done. Uh, what's the best, I think I answered that one. Question keeps coming back. Best way to test for food sensitivity. We're, we're actually this close, folks, to, to having uh, a, you know, a direct-to-consumer comprehensive ability for you to actually be able to do that. Because the demand that we've seen um, is that most doctors just won't do it because they don't acknowledge it. They don't even want to admit that it's real. I've, I've actually had conversations with immunologists where they said there's no such thing as an allergy. I'm like, you're an immunologist. How can you not believe that there's any such thing as an allergy? I mean, it's mind-blowing to me what, what, what some of these doctors believe or think. Um, and that's not to say they're all bad, but it just, it's, it's unfortunate that those are the leaders. What are the vitamin and minerals that help break down histamine? I think I mentioned that already. Vitamin C, vitamin B6, and copper are essential for um, driving DAO forward. Does niacin flush lower histamine problems or does it trigger the problem in the long run? It doesn't. I mean, niacin flush is a vasodilation. It feels like a histamine response because you're getting increased blood flow into the peripheral skin. And so it burns and tingles and can almost even sting and look like you're breaking out in hives. But that in and of itself is not a histamine response. It's, it's, it's a, it just kind of mimics it. How about stress? Does that impact histamine level? Yeah, stress impacts almost everything you do. So aggressive stress certainly can play a role in it. Somebody asked about spirulina, not for allergies. I mean, it's not gonna do much for, for histamine response. Do allergy shots for pet dander in the short term cause more stress on the immune system while recovering from the whiplash effect? Been gluten-free 15 years now, grain-free. Um, I guess this, simply put, the question is about allergy shots. And, and I think it, it depends. So number one, if you're, if you're going to an allergist and they wanna do allergy shots to help you kind of accommodate to an allergen that you can't escape, that sometimes they can be very effective and very helpful, but you, if you're gluten sensitive, you just have to be inquisitive 
about what are the ingredients of the shot. Because a lot of times that's like the mystery. They just, they create it there in the office and they give it to you, but you don't really know what's in the shot. And so it's important that you ask those questions because if there are any gluten-based fillers, then the shots aren't, one, they're not gonna work for you, and two, they might actually end up making you worse. And I've seen that be the case um, where people actually did poorly with the allergy shots, but they can also be helpful. It's actually one area in medicine, I think, where, where you're doing low, it's low dose immunotherapy. You're giving low enough doses of something that a person is allergic to in an effort to minimize and start to mitigate the, the aggressive nature of the immune response. And I think there's some merit to that overall. I just, you know, it would be a lot, in my opinion, it would be a, a last resort type of therapy when diet and lifestyle changes potentially failed. Do I know what foods contain quercetin? Lots of foods. Grapes contain quercetin. Apples contain quercetin. Uh, a lot of your, your, your fruits and vegetables are, are quercetin heavy. So um, tea, green tea is high in quercetin if you drink green tea. My histamine level increased after COVID. A lot, a lot of questions in relationship to histamine and COVID. Um, I, I would just, you know, I would just simply say that when you have an immune response, whether it be a viral attack or assault, it throws your immune system for a loop. It can. Um, and then, and then there's also the other side of it where some people are are being vaccinated. And you know, one of the one of the big risks with the vaccine, aside from there's no long-term safety data, is the ingredients. You could be allergic. You could have an allergic response to those ingredients. But one of the other things that happens in the in the in the vax is a process known as antibody dependent enhancement. And without getting into the complexities of what that really means. What can happen is you get this spike after a vaccine, you get this big spike in antibodies to the spike protein. So you get a spike in antibodies. And, and these are generally IgG antibodies is what is what is spiking typically. And so what happens is when you're, you're what, so when you, when you put that in your body, it hijacks your immune system to focus on doing this. Right, and so what happens environmentally for a lot of people is their immune system is so busy trying to do this, there aren't resources to do the others, to make the IgE, to make the IgM, to make the IgA. These are the things that become compromised. And so you compromise the immune system for the fear of, of a single disease entity when you're surrounded by very potentially dangerous things in your environment every day and it's not just one thing that's dangerous. And so you, you cap your body's ability to do these things while enhancing it to do this against one thing. Yeah, and I, I go back to that, and this is no judgment. I know a lot of you have had, have had the shot and I'm, I'm not here to judge you. I mean, it, it's a decision you made. It's a decision you probably made with, with thought and pause. And, um, you know, regardless, don't take this the wrong way, but you can't live in fear. We're surrounded by very dangerous things every day, right? And there's one thing that we know about being alive, like there's a certainty about life, and that is that life uh, inexorably ends in death, right? And no matter how that comes, and for some it comes faster, and for some it comes slower, and for some it comes more um, dysfunctionally, and for others it, it comes... Um, it, it, it comes naturally. And so, in my opinion, I want it to come naturally. I want to have and enjoy a long quality and a long quality, preferably God, God willing, life. Um, and, and knowing that my immune system is good enough and strong enough to cope and adapt to anything that, that this world can throw at it. And if it's not, you know, then it is, then my time is done. But we live in this fear today, and, and again, it, the, where does that fear come from? I don't want this to be a show about that, but this fear comes from this never-ending driving force uh, of fear porn that's propagated by all the mainstream and, and media outlets and all the news outlets and all the written press outlets. Look, and a lot of my colleagues, including myself, have been censored in major ways, have been threatened by government agencies to be quiet, and it's it's really a little bit ridiculous because we're here we are we're talking about the immune system and allergies but 
A lot of people's allergies are going up as a result of what they've done to their immune system, which is hyper-focus their immune system on producing antibodies to one entity while distracting the immune system from being able to, to fight everything else in the environment. And it's, it's an unfortunate thing. And I, I would just say a lot, of, a lot of people are looking at boosters and looking at all this, you know, fourth and fifth shots coming out. And I would just, I would just encourage you to, to think about, about the outcomes, right? The outcomes of what's happened in the, in the last couple of years because we've got all these shots, but we don't have outcomes that are better because of them. Not really. I mean, and if you look at the data that's being published, it was mandated to be published by the, by the um, I, don't, I don't even want to get into this, but the courts recently mandated that Pfizer relief their trial data because they wanted to hide it for like 60 or 70 years. I don't remember the exact number, but it was a ridiculous amount of time. Why would they want to hide data from us unless the data showed that there was negative consequences to doing these things? And that's exactly what we're learning. And this is one of the things that we're learning from those data drops is that they knew it in the beginning and they ignored it and they wanted to lie to you. And here you are and here we are. And so again, no judgment, but just, you know, what do you do after the fact? Like, what can you do today? Today, what you can do, any body's, any person's body can recover. This is, is not a, a fatalistic um, attitude that I want you to walk away from the show with. But you've got to eat well. You've got to exercise. You've got to get sunshine. You've got to drink clean water and breathe clean air. And in some cases, if you're still struggling, you've got to get objective testing that helps you understand your nutrition and helps you understand how to navigate food and helps you understand how to navigate what your immune system is lacking or what it, what it doesn't have that it needs. And you got to give it the help, right? But you got to do so objectively and don't do it. Don't do it with a mind of fear set. Like don't make these decisions out of a mind of fear. Cause that's what a lot of people did is originally they were just so scared of it that they, that they ran thinking this is the solution. And they didn't even have time to ask the questions and all of the doctors that are out there, you know, promoting it certainly didn't have time to ask questions or entertain experience before they were recommending it. And I, to my opinion, the shame on all of them, shame on every single one of them for, for doing that. Again, that's no judgment on you guys if you've had it done. I just think we have, we have to move beyond this and we have to think about what can we do today to enhance and improve our health today. Okay. Is camu camu powder a good source of vitamin C? It is. It's a very good source of food-based vitamin C. So a lot of people will, will gravitate toward, toward that powder. Um, the key with the powder, though, is, is, is where you buy it and how you, how you get it. Because with vitamin C, to, to protect the actual integrity of vitamin C when you're producing it, it has to be produced or should be being produced under something called a nitrogen blanket. Nitrogen prevents the oxidation of the vitamin C. And I've seen some brands where when, when we actually test what, what vitamin C strength they have, they don't have much. Like it's oxidized vitamin C that the person is getting. And I'm not saying that the brand you're using is that way, but if they're not, if they're not break, processing the vitamin C properly, and a lot of supplement companies don't, you can get a vitamin C that's actually already oxidized. And so in, instead of it helping, you can actually do damage. Yeah, so Nancy says, take pollen from the bee from your region early spring, help you get less allergy. Is it true? I, I, it, you can, and there are a number of people that swear by it. I actually have, we have beehives on my farm and um, we use natural honey. A lot of local natural honey too can, for many people has, has been reported to be very helpful. Let's see here. Abram Hoffer regarded the B3 flush for stress and even trauma management. Histamine seems to be involved in stress of the psyche. Yeah, I don't disagree. And Abram Hoffer's great. I love his, his work. Um, I've got a number of his books on my bookcase shelf. Yeah, somebody mentioned onion peel for quercetin. Mark did. That's, a good, that's another good option for quercetin is onions. Um, I take omega-3s daily. I have natural vitamin C from plants. It's expensive, but so worth it. Allergies are kicking my butt this year, though. I had to go on antibiotics for rhinitis, bronchitis. Okay, no question. Just a commentary. Uh, can taking raw local honey consistently help? Um, yeah, so again, I think I just answered that one. Daily L-methionine, helpful to, for histamine reduction. I haven't seen methionine you know, by itself be any, any kind of effective agent 
for histamine reduction. I, again, I harped on vitamin C because hands down, from an effective, if you're choosing one thing, vitamin C is where it's at. What can help blunt and immediately blunt a, a really bad histamine reaction? Vitamin C. Uh, why do children sometimes outgrow allergies? Is it because their immune system grows stronger as an adult? Yeah, it's, 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 it's several reasons. I mean, it one, it depends on the type of allergy. Generally, Fred, children don't outgrow anaphylactic type of, of food allergies, you know, the kind that cause your lips to swell and, and cause you to need an EpiPen before you die. But they will outgrow some of the minor ones because as they evolve, as they grow and they age, their immune system gets smarter and it learns, right? And that's so, so critical. Our innate immune system is, is, um, is such a gift. And, um, and as we grow, it learns. As, we be, as we're exposed to the environment, our humoral system also learns. It picks up and starts to under th understand things better. And so with that aging comes a wisdom in, and think of it as a, as a wisdom of the immune system to not really being overreactive. And that can sometimes even be the opposite. So like, and sometimes kids, their allergies get worse. And this is where we oftentimes see that the diet is very poor. They're eating, um, they're eating foods that don't, don't do really well. Somebody's asked me about NAET. I've, I've seen some people report that NAET can be very helpful for allergies, but the people that have, I mean, my, my opinion on that, Elaine, is biased in the sense that most of the people that come to see me have had NAET done and they, it didn't work for them. And that's why they're in my office. So again, my, my audience is a little bit biased. My clientele is a little bit more biased just because they're coming to me because something else failed. Um, can people be allergic to the sun? No, they can't be allergic to the sun, just like you can't be allergic to iodine. We talked about that last time. Um, the sun is a necessity for human life. You're not allergic to it, but you may have a problem with your antioxidant and immune system because sunlight emits a radiation, and that radiation your body has to cope with and deal with. The radiation is not always a bad thing as it relates to sunshine. A lot of people run away from the sun because they think, oh gosh, my, my skin doctor told me I was going to have cancer. Sunshine doesn't cause cancer. It, it, sunburning does, right? Repetitive sunburning. But, but you know, low-dose radiation to the sun is a necessity. It's what we call a hormesis or a hormetic effect on human physiology, meaning it creates a stimulation of the immune system to protect us, and, um, but it also helps us make vitamin D and melatonin and other things. So sunshine, you can definitely not allergic to it. Um, let's see here. I was immune to poison ivy until I went through puberty. Um, why would this be? I mean, there are too many factors that when you go through puberty. I mean, you could have gone through puberty. One of the things that happens, Mark, is zinc, um, zinc sequestration to produce the testosterone necessary to fuel the puberty response and zinc being very, very important for your immune system's evolution and response to environmental um, poisons, including poison ivy. I'm, um, let's see here. Okay. Well, I think we're, I think we did it, man. Did we get through all the questions? All the, well, go back up. I know there were two at the very top. I said, I'd get back to, so, um, one of them was how to protect against minimized reaction and clear the dye used with MRIs. Depending on what kind of dye, Elizabeth, um, there are different types of dyes that are used. They're gadolinium dyes, one of the more common ones. But one of the things that you, that you can use is one of the best natural chelators to help push that garbage out of your body is vitamin C. I know I'm going to just give vitamin C a little bit more notoriety this evening. Um, so high doses of vitamin C can be helpful. Um, supporting the liver with NAC can also be helpful. I actually have a product, a formulation called Ultra Metal Detox, which is really designed to help get a lot of that stuff out of you and help your body detoxify naturally from it. So you might give that a try as well. Is there, and then the next one was, there, is there a product or protocol to help clear out radiation from dental x-rays? No, you're not going to clear out radiation from dental x-rays. You're going to have been exposed. Once your cells are exposed to that radiation, the best thing that you can offer them is preventative protection 
from the radiation. Years ago, I was at a space congress. Uh, it was at, at the, at the um, here in Houston, at the George R. Brown Convention Center. There was a what was called COSPAR. It was an international space congress where all the all the physicians and PhD researchers were convening together to discuss the research that is going on in the space industry. And one of the studies was really um, was really enlightening for me. One of the one of the lectures I attended was these doctors had. They had taken mice in outer space and they took different groups of mice and fed them different diets. But what they were doing was they were exposing these mice to ionizing radiation without the Earth's protection, right? Because when you're out in space, you're outside of the Earth's protection. And they fed these mice either berries. So they had one group that was a berry group. They had another group that was a sugar group. And then another was just a water group. And what they found in the berry group is the mice that were fed the berries, the antioxidants, the, the proanthrocyanidins that are rich in those berries, they, they were protected from the radiation, meaning their bodies were not as affected by the radiation because the chemicals in those natural chemicals in those plants, the very same chemicals that protect a berry from, from wilting on the vine when it's 100 degrees in a hot summer day, the blueberry doesn't shrivel up on the bush, right? It stays plump and, and juicy, so to speak. It's because that skin, that coating protects it, has UV protection. So what they found in these mice is that when you, when you transfer that as a food into their body, it actually offers them protection from radiation. And, and the mice that didn't get the berries had developed cancers. So very interesting, and we've seen that study be repeated in a number of other animal studies where, where radiation itself can contribute to DNA damage. And so the way, if you're in a job where you're, where you're around radiation on the regular, you want to protect yourself. You, 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 aside from wearing lead all over your body to protect you from being exposed to the dental x-ray, you want to protect yourself. The best thing, way to do that is antioxidants. And you get antioxidants through food. Again, berries is a great way to get those antioxidants. Other rich, vivid colors of, of fruits and vegetables, those are where the antioxidants live, right? It is in those pigments. And if, you, if, you're, um, if you're wanting supplementation to improve antioxidant function, there's vitamin C, there's zinc, there's glutathione. We have a formula called ultra antioxidants, which is a mixture of many different types of plant-based antioxidants that, that you could also use. Okay, I think we, now we've got more questions, but it's 720 and I'm hungry. So I'm gonna go home and eat and you should too. Um, maybe you're already at home. So um, anyway, thanks for spending Monday evening with me. I hope you walked away with something valuable Look, if you did, I encourage you to share the information. Our goal and our mission um, is to save 100 million lives, and I can't do that alone. You know, my clinic, we don't, we don't see very many people on an annual basis, not to the level of magnitude that we're trying to reach 100 million. So the way we do that is this show. The way we do that is through our newsletter and our outreach. So make sure you share this information. If you know somebody you love and care about who could benefit from it, together we can help change the world. We can help change the minds of the people that make the policies so that everybody can benefit from sound science around nutrition, diet, and lifestyle change. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you next Monday for another episode. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.